In my last contact with my good and gentle friend, Chris, this was the question. Could you talk about color and aesthetics versus that of storytelling? So this is, this is dedicated to Chris. I don't know if anyone recognizes what happened post Monet, but Degas is what happened actually. <laughs> Degas, Degas virtually redefines Western art. Now, nobody redefines anything. I mean, it's all evolution, if you want to call it that. It's all development, it's all standing on the shoulders of giants and all that. But when you get to Degas, who, by the way, at one point said to himself, I consider myself, I believe it was Degas who said this, I consider myself a decorator without a, without a job. <laughs> You'll appreciate what I'm about to show you. But this, this is to start the question of the aesthetic of color, right? And the question of, that comes up about the storytelling use of color is just a little different. But in, in all cases, the point between, the point is that between the two is where we live. We don't isolate ourselves to one. Well, we do, I mean, sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but if we do it exclusively, let's say, to the storytelling side, and we lose track of the aesthetic side, we do lose. And if anyone is going to, to uh, have a problematical situation, it will be a, uh, a, a, an illustrator in a hurry. Uh, because the aesthetics side of color actually is very much requires the time that it takes to explore, to play, to trial and error your way into a beautiful color relation. And it seems to me in Western art, there hasn't been enough time spent in isolating the problem of color. And, you know, and so when you hear a statement like to be well drawn is to be well enough colored, I find that frankly not just shocking, but did a betrayal actually of the aesthetic. Uh, the complete visual eye, the visual world aesthetic, right? How can it neglect color and not see it as, a, as an aesthetic problem? So it's not like it isn't seen always as a problem or it has to be reasonable, but it's actually rather dismissed as being, that's good enough. And is that really a good model? That's good enough? So to be well drawn is to be well enough colored, huh? Look at Degas. You would find... <laughs> I, and I throw these at you again with the, with the uh, proviso that, the, that these images are unlikely truly what they look like in person. First of all, they'll be too brilliantly lit. The light effects will be too strong because that's what you know the, the electronic media does to it, the light-based one where we're painting on a canvas with opaque colors, you know, or in, yeah, so let's leave it at that. But so I'm, I'm going to ask you just to look for a second and tell me what isn't to love about the colors. Now this is this is this is a, talking about a guy who's 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 a brilliant designer on every kind of level, but also a, an explorer in new areas, uh, in both in all aspects of design. And but 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 a guy who doesn't underestimate the significance of doing it really well. In fact, you'd argue that he's made a point of saying this is the point, people. You see what I'm saying? So you get Monet, you get all this amazing new color stuff, and you say, now how are we going to use that? And you look at Degas. And isn't that uh, Monet isn't aesthetic, and we'll talk about that, but it's that we're talking about something right here where a guy puts all this information to use in what great cause? The cause of color beauty. And that is color schemes, color relationships, color dance, color music, okay? Tell me this isn't music in each case here, right? You know, then each of these, by the way, this is a green into to, 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 to a, a, a kind of an orange play, right? Uh, and, you know, we could talk about Degas the way Gamble does and dismisses him rather. It, not, not, I take that back because that's not, really not accurate. Uh, he doesn't dismiss him, but he puts him in another level below Veronese because he says Veronese's color is more complex. Uh, when we look at Hunter, you could argue that Hunter's color is similarly complex frequently with, with Veronese's. Uh, and he's a good colorist, but I'm telling you something here about what I've found, and that is that when you focus on beauty, it doesn't matter of how many colors you have. It's a question of whether you win, right? whether you've actually achieved that 
And these are totally <laughs> beautiful pictures. So as I said, the, the, the sort of green to orange scheme, you know, if you want to call it that, that's the secondary color scheme, or the purple into whatever these are toward, you see that orientation toward a turquoise with plus purple, plus whatever warm color you have in this thing, and you're suddenly finding yourself in these worlds. Now, if you look at these colors individually, you're going to miss the point. If you don't see the beauty of this thing as a general impression coloristically, you haven't seen anything. By the way, I didn't show, uh, and I, I do talk about him, uh, Albert Moore, uh, but I don't, don't show him in these pictures because Albert Moore is rather, if you want to call that a tonalist in color, he rather takes yellow and then makes a yellow picture, but he's self-consciously doing it. Degas, every painter who paints, uh, paints their picture of your colorist is actually going to have an orientation. This one is toward purple. This one, you might say, is toward green, if you want to say that. Or you could say toward orange. It doesn't matter, but you know, there's an orientation toward the dominant color in every picture. So uh, uh, let's go on. Um, look at these three now. Again, first look at them. This is, again, these are probably false, but there's a unity that's inherent that you can't escape from. Uh, this one's a yellow picture. This is, we could call it a pink picture compared to this one, which is, you could call it a blue picture. I'm showing them that way for a reason, right? The red, yellow, blue model. And each, within each one of them is the proper red, yellow, and blue for that blue color scheme that you've set up there, right? So there's that majesty, the beauty of this gold. And remember, Degas is a guy who's saying um, there's nothing more beautiful than two colors, the same color in two values side by side. You could say about two, the same value, the two chromas side by side of the same color, two different chromas side by side of the same color. And there's a way they play off of each other. Is everything he's doing is now he's talking about the music, and that's called, it's called color play, right? So this is just beautiful, beautiful things. I mean, you talk about this note right here in the middle of this area, just how stunning it is. And yet it's absolutely lost. You don't even see it for a bit. And yet these are individually beautiful notes. And yet the total color scheme is the whole point, right? And so there's this movement from the, from the, from the uh, lemon-type yellows all the way over into these brown-oriented yellows, the warm yellows, right? Uh, movements through the reds, uh, you know, all the play of red uh, dancing through this thing, the green, and the green into blue, whatever you want to call it, uh, but, you know, without getting into it in little ways, this is the decorative side of painting, okay? This is what I'm going to call the aesthetic. This is the aesthetic of, of, of color. Now, if you miss this as an, as an imaginative painter, you've missed a lot. So let's, let's, let's leave you one last treat here. And why, why don't I give other people equal time when I talk about the decorative side? Because this guy is it. I mean, like, nothing's happened like this before. And I, you think I'm crazy? Tell me. Show me who's done it. Uh, I don't even frankly think that Veronese is as magical in a color sense, in the sense that you would actually say, let's decorate our wall with Veronese. It's just beautiful in color internally. It makes the most beautiful little combinations. Like a guy wears a green thing and he's got the right green in that green and the right yellow in the green of the costume this guy's wearing. And he isolates these spots like that. And the whole impression is just a generalized, truthful thing with lots of beautiful color stuff in it. But this guy unifies around one larger idea in all cases, right? And then he explores through that larger idea, which is the very definition of, 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 of good composition, of beauty, right? It's that interplay into one, right? Or out of one many, out of many, one, <laughs> from many into a great unity. Now that's the, where the aesthetic comes from, right? All the things people want to say about whether some pictures are too bright or some are too dull, or, and there's no such meaning. So they're, they're very beautifully aesthetic pictures in high chroma, and they're very, very beautiful ones in muted tones. So here you are, I'm showing you Hunter, Bob Hunter, and I suggest to you that this actually is not like, uh, I'll go back and look at the difference. It's not like this. It's a different use of color, but this guy is the great colorist of the gamel education world. He's the guy that actually gets color. These are beautiful color schemes, but as you can see that each one of these larger schemes, this one's a green base, one's easy to see that, right? But these are very different schemes from each other. Uh, this one's a relatively muted world, right, isn't it? This is a very rich world, but it's a darker scheme, and yet there's, there's the play of these rich, rich, rich notes in this darker scheme. And, and this was more self-consciously all about the green, so to speak, and yet obviously it's about the orange to green thing that we saw in... Uh, but just look at them, but don't, don't take my word for it. This is, this is aesthetic. This is color as an aesthetic, okay? There's no storytelling here. We'll go to that in a second. All right. Did I go the wrong way? <laughs> I was going backwards. I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. All right. Now, so this is a, and I, I'm here to talk about the Boston School. Don't ever forget that, okay? So I'm, I'm always going to try to bring them into it. But this is the use by Benson of decorative color, right? Which is just purely color for its own aesthetic. I'm showing you these because this shows you how they were, they, this, these, these, these hexagon, uh, octagons were set up in this Library of Congress. And you see the blues in here? 
these colors are all already out there. He's just deciding to play the blue up in here. The lights are already out there. He's not doing anything except decorating, you know, with spots and patterns and things like that within a given color scheme. And that's, that's, that's an aesthetic, right? That's actually maintaining the aesthetic of the building, of the architecture, right? But so this is aesthetic color as opposed to simply uh, true color notes or uh, whatever. It's all played for one very specific reason. If these two are true in relation to each other, this is a more purple picture. This is a more green one. I think they're more similar to each other than these pictures show. But it's been a long time since I've seen either one of them in person. Again, uh, murals. Now, when you get down to this, is a very different world, right? This is the storytelling world. And this is where you start really talking. Uh, what's the point? So, so this is a storytelling picture. This is the, the this is the philosopher. So this is the mind. You might say the world of a philosopher, the search for for light, right? This guy in a dark place. So, you know, so I like this. I love this spiraling up into his mind, you know, and the spiraling around, searching. This is all full of other kinds of symbolisms, if you want to call them that. But that, but that one very clear one, though, if you're talking about the philosopher, is a search through darkness for what is the very nature of man and all that sort of stuff. Very striking symbolism, and you need the darks, right? I think these might be over dark, even darker than he put down, but, but uh, and nor the lights lighter, but but that's very much symbolic, right? This muted one, this is the death of Caesar, and here's his good friend, or or not. Uh, uh, so Caesar on the floor here, but look at the look at the funereal colors that are being used here. This is for for drawing your spirits down to to accommodate the storyline, right? Uh, and again, you can talk about symbolism of the reds, you know, if you want to, uh, the blood, but you eventually rise and realize this is actually telling you what just happened. Uh, it's and not that you weren't going to get it before that, by the way. And I want to say, by the way, this guy, Jerome, is as masterful a designer as ever happened in, in uh, storytelling pictures, period. I mean, there, I don't know if there's anybody better on a routine, everyday basis, really, really tops. Um, and Jerome, of course, was the teacher of, uh, of both, both Bunker and... Um, um, well, and Sargent, by the way, but and Paxton as well, the Boston School type guy. Uh, but here again, you can see that the use of the the reds in particular, you know, this is not a happy day for maybe, but it's a bloodletting day. It's a nasty day. I shouldn't say maybe, but but you see the reds, rather the blood-like reds and the feeling of red, you know, all has to do with this question of whether this guy's going to actually be, 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 be assassinated, murdered on the spot or not. Um, the, the thumbs down thing, what, I forget what the Latin word for that was. But you can see the color is really, really, it's got a certain nastiness to it, doesn't it? Uh, in that sense of, you know, it's all high excitement, but it's all, it's also very, very bloodthirsty and dark. So look at these, I mean, this is, so this is color. Now we're talking values when you talk about these. When you start talking about, uh, uh, the, say the storyline, the Boccaccio poem about Isabella and, and the pot of basil, that's her boyfriend's, Sick, sick, sick thing, but his boyfriend's, uh, some part of his body is in this thing, his head, actually. She's gone crazy. She's gone berserk. So she's, she's gone out and found the body of, the, of her boyfriend's that was, that was murdered by her brothers who didn't want her marrying this guy. And uh, she goes slowly nuts. Uh, but look at the, look at the, look at the, uh, the neutrality of the colors, right? This is, again, one of those death-like, very much like, isn't it, like the um, death of Caesar, Really dark, mad a little bit, right? Uh, very elegant in many ways, the use of light and all that sort of stuff. And of course, this is N.C. Wyeth, and um, if you uh, get a chance, I would suggest you see that show in um, Maine, in Portland, Maine. It's very worth your time. Uh, I had no idea some of these pictures were actually virtually, I don't know if they're as much as four feet high, a lot of these illustrations. So they actually look like they would be if, when you see them in person. I mean, like when you see them in prints, but then they are actually. So anyway, but there again, that's that. There's a, there's a, this hopelessness of sorts that's being created by the sense of color. Or in this case here, this is the opium den, right? Look at this guy's face turned yellow. But the whole thing has got this sick quality that you sort of expect if you're going to go in there and lose your mind and hallucinations or where, whatever that that whatever uh, takes you, opium takes you. So look at the use of color. I mean, they're very much making this into a very sick world, and yet he's got a certain aesthetic. It's nowhere near as beautiful in, the, in that way. All three of these are, are nice, and they're not bad aesthetically, uh, but they're nowhere, this is nowhere near the, 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 uh, the feast that you see in a Degas. This is pure visual color magic, right? So not to pick on it by any means. It's, it's beautiful, but it hasn't been, that hasn't been the focus. And again, typically, these illustrators are dealing with time frames, time constraints. Um, 
And again, the mood, right? So here you have a tar bell. And here's this woman looking at something very precious to her, obviously, the way she's holding her hands, all that stuff is expressed in the gesture. So there's a storytelling element where this woman is, and again, what is that? You know, it's a book, uh, it, it might be a book of poetry for all we know, it might be a, an album of, of a, a wedding album. Uh, who knows, right? A scrapbook uh, with precious items in it. So, um, but look at the entire quiet of the tones and the colors. It's not a screaming, highly chromatic picture. It's the reverie model, right? It's the one of quiescence, right? And these are in the, rather the same family. This is Homer, and this is uh, Pleisner. And they're both talking, you know, so the storm at sea, that feeling of a storm coming in, the feeling of uh, a little bit of danger, a little bit of foreboding, a little bit of all that stuff. It's all significantly done with the color, right? Uh, it, you know, and, and the value contrast, by the way. And value is a significant, huge part of color, right? So don't misunderstand that. Many of these pictures um, uh, maintain that sense without the color portion, without being a golden color. This probably still comes across. And that's where you wouldn't be wrong in, if you understand values and saying uh, to be well, val you know, to get your drawing well, if you mean things like value mass relationships, right? But I count that to be a factor... If you're talking about value in drawing, you're talking about form making and things like that. Uh, the spotting of masses, that's a color problem. That's a color. So the distribution of major masses is actually part of color from my way of thinking. And, uh, and so that distribution of color masses, uh, yeah, these things will come across as somber because the whole picture is low contrast and middle, middle value, not, not high value. This is obviously something that has a little more light in it, right? A little more feeling of the, it's, it's, a, it's a more of a positive experience. This one isn't a, this is somewhere in between, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, so give Fleiser some credit. I think he comes out of sort of the art students league background in, in the old days. He was about Gamel's age. And I met him uh, in, 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 at Williamstown. Uh, he, he came by to see him uh, from time to time. He, and I think he lived in upstate New York or Vermont. But, um, but his uh, composition uh, rather, re on, on many, many a day is rather strong very mu and very much like, uh, like Jerome's in, 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 in his understanding of main lines and things like, things like that. But let's talk about color in a very different way for just a second. I showed you this, I think, in the last, in the last uh, thing we did. But this is um, the source. You keep on remembering uh, Ang talking about the source. So the question here is about aesthetics color and color as storytelling, right? So here you are. Wanting, you must become the master of the world in front of you. So you begin to understand what it takes to make the difference in the moods. Look at the difference between the moods of these two pictures. Now, this guy is not a mood painter. He's just hitting the notes. He says it. He's trying to paint the light of the day. He's trying to get the colors to do this thing, to project that general impression of that day for that 20-minute period or whatever period of time it was there. But obviously, this, this, is, this creates a definite mood, doesn't it? And remember the, um, the uh, which I'm not showing, the Maxfield Parishes, this has got very much that mood that goes with kind of a, a sense of the mystery of, uh, you know, some magical kingdom that the way Parrish uses it. But that, right, that's, that sets a mood. This sets an entirely different one, doesn't it? And this is just nature. So you see how we're mining. We're mining to get these things. We just are mining nature. So that's why when you set something up, do, when you're trying to, even if you're an imaginative painter, set up by trial and error your color scheme. So you can get to that place where it's also contributing, where it becomes this, maybe the first thing people see from across the room. It probably is going to be the spotting, but if it's the color, you want it to be the color that tells the story. So I think of it sometimes, the big spotting, I always think that way, or the big distribution of, of darks and lights on a page from across the room and its value relationships from across the room. That usually is something what I say is rather like the music, the, the, the introductory music in a movie, right? Uh, what's that called? There's proper word for that. It's just escaping me at the moment. Um, the overture. So if you say that from across the room, you see these tones, you're going to know that this is not going to be some murder picture. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be some dark day and, you know, whatever. But, uh, but anyway, what I'm saying is now, again, this is my point. If you can't do this, if you can't mine nature like this, if you don't know what it takes to make these things on the spot and make them do what they do truthfully, you won't have this facility. You'll be missing the whole mining process where you're searching for, for uh, not just uh, how a thing appears, which is the most important thing, 
but how you'd ever get to that, you know, how would you, how would you play with color until that thing happened? You know, that's different. And I say again, it's different from uh, storytelling pictures that have uh, 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 figures already pre-drawn and all that sort of thing, where basically you're just saying, you know, you're saying much more limited things. You could get, you can get away with just saying what color is this and what color is that, and do those colors go together and do they contribute to the story? But uh, again, just enjoy the fantastic unity of these ensembles, the way these colors play to each other in nature. Learn to be able to paint in a unified way like that and mine it for both the aesthetics, which I barely talked about just then, but also the, the ability to, to contribute to your as story if you're a narrative painter. All right? And on at some level, by the way, everybody's a narrative painter, as I've said to you before. So... Um, I'm going to go back and see if there's anything I've forgotten to mention. But thank you uh, uh, for uh, paying attention to these things to the end of the, of the show because uh, it's amazing how hard it is to actually make each of these statements, each of these parts of these things add up if you don't listen to the rest of the story and get to the end of the conversation. So, all right. So there's Bob Hunter again, beautiful color schemes, each one of them being different. And by the way, his standard thing was a neutral color in the background, <laughs> uh, you know, generally neutral. And, uh, and so his richest stuff would always wind up in, that's the center of interest area, right? It's a it's sort of a classic approach to design. So is the pyramid, by the way, that he does repeatedly. But um, you see what the idea of a center of interest is and how it works and all that sort of thing. But we're talking about color today. And just look at the beauty of the color relations. And there's nothing like that coming out of the, that ever came out of, I think, of the... Uh, uh, and I'm one of those guys. Uh, nobody's ever really been as much of a, of, a, of a virtuoso. And I would say this, by the way, about Robert Douglas Hunter, that he actually believed in the concepts of taste, right? Uh, but this, you know, in a sense, these aren't really... I mean, the taste, what does taste have to do with this? Well... You just stay, stay in the game of aesthetics until you have something that's really tasteful. It, most of us don't do enough trial and error until we find that most beautiful thing, that most delightful thing in color, and he does. So there you are. Uh, thank you all very much, uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Um, do subscribe, uh, like, share, etc. Thank you.